So um, good afternoon for me as well. Um, so my name is Dirk Klaassens. I'm um, responsible for IBM's industrial products industry, which is mainly metals mining and industrial equipment um, globally, living and working out of uh, Antwerp in Belgium. And so main task is uh, for an industry team from IBM is to develop design solutions which are of relevance to the industries we're dealing with, working together with our research and innovation teams and so on. And then in the partnerships we have with uh, the mining companies around the world, make sure you get the full value of, uh, of what we have. So the, the title is the Internet of Things in Advanced Analytics for the Mining Industry. Um, I'm going to have to give you a little bit of technology speak at the front. Um, and, and the trouble with technology in IT is, is very, very often they become buzzwords. So you'll have to bear with me just for five minutes. Uh, I'm, I'm just going to take you through it because I do feel there's a reality behind it now. Uh, I do feel if you, if you talk about Internet of Things, there have been recent develop developments and innovations which we didn't have maybe five years ago. And I do think that, um, you know, for the mining industry in particular, the, there's quite, quite some advantage to be had. I, I, I always say, just give you an idea of the size of the industry for IBM, and, and sometimes people would ask you the question, is IBM active in the mining industry? For us, the industry is around $3 billion worth of turnover every year, and um, um, it's one of the fastest growing, particularly in the solution area. And, and the reason behind it is, um, if you're in a high-risk industry like the mining industry, is your, your commodity market facing, you have um, a high risk profile in terms of health and safety, you're uh, asset intensive, you work in remote locations and so on. If you bring predictability into the discussion, very often you get a, a listening ear. And, uh, and so to mitigate the risks you're dealing with, very often um, analytics and advanced analytics and particularly predictive analytics make a lot of sense. Particularly, uh, we were with Rio Tinto earlier on in New York for a couple of days, and, and they've got their integrated operations center in Perth. They've done all the hard work in integrating all the data, at least of the Pilbara region, into um, one location, huge location. Lots of screens, people walking around. They feel strongly about the fact that they now need to take the last mile, to, you know, take the last step to add all the value they can to all the information which is coming through in that one location, and that's what we're working on with them. So advanced analytics, and, and, and also, the, you know, they would tell you, and, 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 and most people would tell you, if you look at the way this industry has evolved and what you've been going through the last couple of years, um, productivity is the mantra, right? So productivity is the way to go. So on one hand, you have the productivity drive coming out of the commodity super cycle, and, and it was all about volume. If you talk about productivity, analytics is a, is a relatively non-intrusive and low threshold way to get productivity gains. And then if you can consume it as an operating, uh, operating expense with CapEx being scarce as it is, again, it makes a lot of sense to go into that direction. So really that's the, the setting of, of, uh, of this discussion. And again, I really feel strongly about the fact that lately uh, a lot of progress has been made uh, in terms of uh, technology that allows you to, to make that step. I'll just you hear a lot about it, uh, you hear a lot about it, uh, you hear a lot about Industry 4.0, you hear a lot about Internet of Things. I'll just define it real quick to set the scene and then we'll, as quickly as we can, we'll go into some points of view and use cases. Obviously, we're talking about the fourth industrial revolution. It's actually the, our friends from Germany who framed the term. There was this, this, this uh, realization, a lot of recent technology innovations, the Googles, you name it, the, the Facebooks came out of the US, maybe it's time Europe should do something, and so somebody in the government area around in, in Germany said, you know what, we're really in the fourth industrial revolution. Uh, coming from the, the steam age into mass production and then of course electronics for automation, and now we have this opportunity for machines to start talking to each other and giving directions to the shop floor on how to optimize production and, and get maximum value out of the production chain. So that's really what the fourth uh, industry 4.0 means. It's the fourth industrial revolution driven by machine-to-machine um, -machine communication, modeling um, machines and equipment in cyberspace, optimizing uh, and providing insi insights and feeding it back into, uh, into the shop floor. And then you have the Internet of Things platform, which is, if you will, the way I, I like to frame it is a, a foundation or an uh, enabler for this industry for it to, to take place. So in essence, 
in essence, what you have is in your value chain, you have more and more, you have through the automation that recently has happened, data being generated. It can be fed into a um, cloud-enabled platform. And the cloud part, I mean, the technical part is not so important. What, what is important for you as a, as, a, as a user and a client is that it can be uh, offered as a service. You consume it as and when you go. So from a business standpoint, the, the, the innovation is discussion is much more important than from a technological discussion. You consume it as you go. So here you have these uh, cyber physical systems as they're called. So the in the cyber space, you model what's going on in the physical world. At least you model what's essential to drive optimal uh, functioning of, of, of the systems going on on the, on, the, on the shop floor. You feed back the information and the, and the, um, uh, uh, the optimal decisions to the shop floor. Just to touch on a couple of things which are really new. Um, we, we did um, a workshop with a steel company in Europe not so long ago. And we, sp we spoke about, you know, like, let's give you some cases. Let's talk about predictive maintenance on the asset side, operation analytics, mind to ship, and so on. And the audience said, yeah, well, what's new? You know, we've been hearing this for a while. So what, what is so new that we have these terms going on? Can you please explain what is new? What is new, what I just explained, on a, on a first, first of all, the ingestion and the capability to get these data um, into um, uh, an Internet of Things platform and the way it's been structured and architected is new and much more efficient than it was. You have the option to deal with big data. Uh, there's technologies, Hadoop and so on, who've been developed to, to, to work with both structured and unstructured data and make sense out of it. That's a new technology. You have the possibility through uh, advanced programmable uh, interfaces for these various systems to start talking to each, uh, each other. And that is actually really where you make the step change, right? It is not a question of enabling one system here and then you get some advantage, really where you have the advantage, and I'll explain it to you in a second through an example. When they start communi communicating to each other and then feed that integrated, optimized information back to the shop floor, is when you make the, uh, the step change in terms of productivity. So there's quite a few new techno technological elements in this platform that have come, become available the last couple of years that allow you to make that next step in productivity gains, which is then called Industry 4.0. And by the way, Industry 4.0 is a German initiative, call it a European initiative. You would find something in the US, you would find something in other places that's kind of similar. But um, I think uh, Industry 4.0, uh, as a term, uh, we come across most, of, most often. So that's what it is, right? So you have a physical operation, uh, driving information up, you analyze and decide, and then you get the action uh, feedback. And you have this communication with other what they call cyber physical systems, uh, integrating and talking to each other to give you a fully optimized, a fully optimized um, environment. There's an interesting debate ongoing now, and, be, be, and, and I really like to discuss it yourselves whenever it needs to be, but there's a really interesting debate going on in, in who owns the data. And I'll give you an example. Um, I was presenting to Caterpillar in Peoria to their mining team a couple of months ago, and, um, and I was presenting a case, a case we did with a mining operator in Australia, a company called Thies, and I've, and I've got the case, I'll explain it to you in a minute. So basically, you know, predictive analytics on, uh, on fixed assets, on rolling assets in this case. Um, and the gentleman, Ed Rapp is his name, he runs the mining uh, business for Caterpillar, raised his hand and said, so how does this work? So you, IBM, you're doing these kinds of projects, say, whatever, in the Pilbara in Australia, uh, on our trucks, and then we come in and actually what we would like to do is do exactly the same thing across our fleet, and then, of course, Komatsu is doing the same and so on. Ultimately, the decision lies with the client. Um, and it's kind of sensitive because, obviously, Caterpillar wants to own the space. They want to own the customer experience. And there's some kind of conflict of interest, if you will, or, or interesting um, discussion to be had uh, if you're Caterpillar and you work through your dealerships and you incentivize them by giving them tar targets on spare parts, whereas you as a mining company want to control maintenance cost, maintenance expense, um, and of course, uh, at the same time, uh, increase the reliability of the assets, you have kind of a different viewpoint. So this is ongoing as we speak, um, and it's 
bit of land grab at the moment. I think if you, you could, you know, Joy Global, all of them are actually going into this kind of direction, knowing that they need to grab it before somebody else takes it. Um, and then as a mining company, um, obviously you want to have control uh, on this as well for the reasons just mentioned. We're sitting kind of in the middle, uh, facilitating, uh, providing the platforms that allow you to do these kinds of analytics. We never own the data, we never own the insights. We provide the solutions for uh, people interested in, in, in building these kinds of solutions. So it really gets interesting when, uh, and so now I'll, I'll start working through some examples. Um, I'll touch upon them really briefly now, and then we'll go deeper into the individual ones. Uh, but what I said earlier is it really gets interesting when you have um, the various call them cyber physical systems, uh, the various solutions enabled over the Internet of Things talking to each other. And people very often, you know, the Komatsu case, Caterpillar, whatever it may be, talk about the condition of the equipment. Um, first and foremost, um, you know, asset uh, uh, reliability, predictability, when is it going to break down and so on. It's a space in advanced analytics many people are looking at and trying to develop solutions and provide it as an extra service on top of the equipment being installed or sold um, as a services business to be grown and a so sort of, you know, again, grabbing the client <coughs> experience, moving away from the old uh, dealership model I just described into really entering into the client experience of the equipment being provided. But there's the employee condition as well, obviously. Um, and it's, it's, it's relatively easy to do. And I've got an example, and I'll explain it to you. What is the condition of the employee at any given point in time, particular, particularly if they're operating in a mine, if they're operating a big truck or heavy and expensive equipment, it's a good thing to know what the condition of your employee is. Then you have the operation as well. So what is going on in my operation? Uh, can you actually visualize and optimize what's going on in the operation? If you look at, I like to take the example of iron ore as a value chain. It's kind of easy. So if iron ore, say iron ore, steel and automotive. If you look at automotive <coughs> as the final consumer product, the production and operation environment is fully controlled, uh, fully controlled and optimized, robotics, everything, right? So you have a full grasp of what's going on at any <coughs> given point in time in your operation. You look back at a steel plant, again, closed environment, but kind of violent, kind of uh, difficult to control, un unpredictable things happen, breakdowns and everything else. So somewhat more difficult. Then you go to an open pit iron ore mine and there you have the terrain and the weather condition, everything else that goes with it, the vast expanse of it. Can you superimpose a virtual kind of shop floor on top of what's going on so you have a much better grip what's happening on your work site? And that's the idea here and I have an example, a real example as well. And then mine to ship. It's been, this is a term that's been a, a around for a while, but if a shovel goes down, can you then reallocate your equipment and your, your crew to a different pit and maybe there's um, a delay in, in production because of it. Maybe you want to notify the ships coming through um, and so on. So uh, once you start uh, hooking one into the other and have a full end-to-end -end view, mind the ship uh, on the operation, the equipment condition and the employee condition in one go. Nobody's doing a project like this at this point in time. This is a vision you may have, and then you may select, okay, I've got priority uh, here or there. I'll start working it, but I'm building a platform that will enable me to, through all the data I'm gathering, and most people would have a lot of data sitting there already. Um, and you could, e you know, even the ones who are known as the more advanced ones, whether it's Rio Tinto or anyone else, would, would, would say so themselves. Look, we've got vast amount of data, but we're not using it. We're not using it. So what about employee safety? Um, we call it employee safety. You can call it employee condition. Technology today allows you to monitor the employee condition. And I'll, I'll zoom into it uh, uh, f uh, further on. But you have data you are um, uh, collecting from the employee. There's two dimensions here. One is the short-term action reaction. If something happens to the employee, what are you going to do? Can you notify people that something's wrong and can you then respond to it based on biometric data, environmental data, and so on? Um, acceleration data, somebody's tripped. Uh, can you go and have a look and see what's, what's going on to save the person uh, from getting uh, seriously injured? 
importantly, you're building up a database as well. So you can start predicting unsafe situations before they actually take place. So you got um, the data coming through, through wearables, well-known technology, not expensive, um, <coughs> being tested in hard circumstances. Uh, you monitor the condition of the employee. There's always a safety aspect. Safety always has a productivity uh, aspect, flip side as well. Uh, and so you know exactly what's going on with the individual. <coughs> Real technology, real projects. I always say I have a strong feeling that technology is underutilized in the area of safety compliance. It's a cultural discussion. That's true. It's an education discussion. Fine, we can do more. Uh, we were speaking on a mining conference, safety mining conference a couple months ago. And um, people would tell you, We've managed to get under control um, the famous pyramid, right? So from relatively minor injuries right <coughs> up to fatalities at the top, it used to be a paradigm. People would tell you almost anonymously uh, that that pyramid doesn't exist anymore. Our biggest concern is fatalities. We can't get the fatalities under control. Can we do something more? We need to take the next step, some shape or form. What can we do? Um, I'll come back to it in a second. So monitoring the condition of the employee at any given point in time. Then you have the truck. And typically, if you go with the OEMs, and with all respect, uh, the equipment manufacturers, the OEMs, they would focus on the, uh, the sensors on, uh, on, uh, on the equipment being provided. Um, but there's many more, much more data to be, to be looked at to actually come to full predictability and understanding of what's going on with the asset you're looking at. It can be, um, so here's the sensor data, that's a classic, what, what's happening in the environment, terrain condition, in conditions, weather, and so on, what's the, what's the correlation there? What are the maintenance data, historical data, looking back? Um, and then financial as well. It shouldn't only be predictive, like, okay, this turbine and this part of the truck will break down two weeks from now. People would like to know, so what can I do? What, what should I be doing? Um, can I get some more life out of it before it breaks down because I'm working on a very important order uh, and so on. So it should become prescriptive more than just simply predictive um, to add much more value. Then you go into the operation. I think I just described it. It's uh, something we did with um, uh, a mining uh, company in Brazil. Can you visualize properly what's going on in the mine and take the right decisions around it? It's kind of amazing how many use cases you get just out of that. Um, again, this is this virtual shop floor being superimposed on an open pit. Of course, it can be a, a, an underground mine as well, but in this case, it's an open pit mine. Uh, what it actually is going on? You always have systems. You have dispatch systems. You have alarms going off in the control rooms and so on. But can you really make it easy to look at, interpret what's happening, and then act upon it? And then finally, the, the mine to ship environment, like I described it, you know, again, commercial data uh, of importance. What are the inventories we've got, stockpile information, when are the ships coming in and so on, uh, and then optimizing it end to end. Again, communicating, talking to each other to give you an end to end view of, uh, of, um, uh, of your company. So let's just take them one by one and give you some, uh, some, some, uh, some more in-depth uh, insights on, uh, on what this is. So the employee condition monitoring actually comes from a military application, actually it comes from the, the sensors themselves. We have uh, researchers in, uh, in Haifa in Israel um, and they live, so around Haifa you have a whole ecosystem of, um, of companies, startups, that initially provided this kind of technology to the military. So you would have a jet pilot uh, pulling, pulling his G's in the F-16, whatever. And of course, command center always wants to know exactly what the condition of the pilot is, so uh, they know exactly what's going on, not just the plane, also the pilot. And so they would put sensors in the helmet to uh, feed back to command center uh, what the situation is. Um, and that's biometric data, temperature, blood pressure, whatever, you know, um, uh, and so on, pulse. So they, they would give you that, uh, that information. So that, that's come down into the civil world, if you will. And of course, it's easy to transfer that into the helmet of a, of a mine worker. Then you have another sensor, this is an example, but it, another sensor into the vest of the mine worker that gives you the motion 
uh, view. So tripping, slipping, jumping, uh, um, uh, intensity of activity, and so on. If you just combine those two already, um, you get a wealth of information you can start working with. Then you've got the outside information as well, the environmental data coming through, outside temperature and so on, noise, um, gases and so on, and you can start building rules databases that would tell you when a situation is becoming dangerous. And then you can start doing things with that. You can have a mobile, this is built through a mobile application, so your mind worker would have a mobile device with them, and then people would say, but that's dangerous in itself because people were looking, texting and, and walking through the mine and maybe fall into a pit. <coughs> but you can help that. You can kind of prevent that from happening. You can say, look, the only thing that works in the mine is the safety app. Or you can even replace the, uh, the iPhone or whatever it may be by another device altogether that gives you the same functionality. So, um, so you know, you've got the mobile device, it will tell you, okay, we're, we're building shields around the uh, employee. It will tell you, okay, he's wearing the helmet, he's wearing the jacket, it's all good. It will tell you, I detect a slip. It will ask the employee, are you okay? If he doesn't respond within 30 seconds, people in the vicinity and the ship super, super shift uh, supervisor, as well as the uh, safety coordinator will be notified and people will go there and help out as the short-term reaction I just described. Same time, like I said, you build up a massive database of information from a safety standpoint. So you could say, in this area in the mine, we're seeing a, a spike in, uh, in safety incidents, there's something wrong, let's fix it. Or you can start, you can start building up uh, rules databases that tell you if the temperature of the individual rises by X in an environment of Y, no more than 30 minutes or um, uh, you know, the situation becomes dangerous and so on. So you can really start doing proactive alerting uh, with the technology and uh, uh, prevent things from happening. The wearables, the sensors are like $30 each. You can buy them on Amazon.com, right? It is nothing uh, really exotic about them. They are openly uh, available. You can demo them, it's good fun. Um, it's real. And again, the, the, the essence or the, the knowledge or the expertise sits in the building of the, the rules database around the mobile device. So you get this information, this is dangerous, this is not dangerous, this is gonna be dangerous, uh, and then all the conclusions you draw from that. So equipment uh, condition monitoring, where we really started, and that's, this is already uh, four or five years ago, is with Thies, mining contractor in Australia. And, and the reason why they came to us was um, their business model was changing. So all of a sudden they, they moved away from, or they were asked to move away from uh, charging per time unit to charging per ton produced. So all of a sudden they had to really take control of the reliability of their fleet, uh, in this case Caterpillar, because they are, uh, I think they are the, the biggest Caterpillar client in Australia, to um, really understand what's going on with the trucks. As a matter of fact, back to the point I made earlier, who owns the data and there's this friction between the OEMs and their clients. When a Caterpillar truck arrives on site at uh, being operated by Thies, they would take off all the uh, automation and sensor equipment delivered standard by CAT and they would put, put in their own. And so they let us work on the thing and I, I think we all realize the, the cost of, of, of unforeseen uh, breakdowns and everything else, so the business case is kind of overwhelming. Um, and then so they give us uh, a number of years of his historic data to start working on. And they asked us to give him a double run, you know, right? So parallel run. So we'll look at your equipment and we'll start predicting and we need to at least get 75% uh, reliability of the prediction that this part of the truck will break down if you do nothing within the next 48 hours. Um, and this is how it was presented. So rule number one is, you know, and maybe this looks kind of complicated, but the, the, for the operator, uh, you need to give a very simple picture. You, you can't give him more information. As a matter of fact, it should be less information to work with. The operators in the control room, same thing, can't give him more information. Just give him a number and, and, and a maintenance advice. Like the number uh, for this part of the equipment is 75. It's, it exceeds the threshold. You need to bring it in uh, the workshop within the next 24, 48 hours. That's really what you should be doing. So from a user interface, it's almost as important as the 
the complexity of the algorithms behind this thing, which is quite substantial, uh, to, to really come to, uh, to conclusions. So there's something wrong with the right strut. As a matter of fact, um, you know, the chances of, of it uh, not making uh, the, the 500 hours it needs to go into maintenance is 95% or whatever the number may be, uh, way too high. Uh, and then you have a choice. You have a choice of either saying, bring it in, bring it in now, um, and deal with it. Uh, because, of course, maintenance cost-wise, whatever these KPIs would tell us, is a third cheaper to do to, to a, a repair job than something, for example, whatever. Uh, so you need to, uh, your choice is to either go make this, or you can tell the operators to drive slower at half the load, and then you can finish the order we're working on because it's an important order. Now that becomes a change management challenge, right? Because there's no operators to be found who will drive a truck below maximum speed and load it below maximum load. So it was a huge uh, debate we had with this particular client. Um, it's a change management, it's, it's, you know, I always tell the teams, there's no such thing as a no-brainer, right? So you always need to deal with people, and they will have their own opinions, and you need to deal with it as much as it makes all the sense in the world. So you can start giving them advice and saying, okay, so then the event likelihood becomes much lower. Uh, you know, follow the procedures, reduce speed and capacity, and then all of a sudden, 5% will break down. Okay, we can live with that, uh, and off you go. That's the way it's been, uh, it's been designed in this case. But it's fascinating because purely looking at numbers, purely looking at historic data, we're doing another project on static equipment. I'm always talking about rolling equipment apparently, but in static equipment, car dumpers, um, a mining company in, uh, in Australia at this point in time. And um, the, the assignment started three or four months ago. And all, all of a sudden in August, uh, two of the car dumpers broke down and they lost one million tons of, of uh, iron ore uh, over that period of time, like two or three days. Um, massive cost, right? And nobody seemed to understand uh, what the r reason was. Now for us, I mean, it's very unfortunate this thing happened. They lost a million, like, iron ore price, whatever, $50, $60 a ton. A lot of money of iron ore throughput. But nobody really, for, for us, so for us it was kind of interesting, but here you go, here's a, a catastrophic event. Now let's look at the data weeks, months before uh, the event occurred. And there's various types of data can, you can look at, look at, as I said. We looked at uh, alerts coming through. We looked at uh, outliers through the sensor data. And we looked at performance data. So if you look at uh, energy consumption and so on. So those three sources, we didn't even look at, still didn't look at, uh, for instance, maintenance data, which can be very interesting as well. So just looking at those three, um, and a long story short, what we found out was an early indicator of uh, something that was going to happen in a talk of weeks is, um, and there were two car dumpers working uh, next to each other so we could nicely compare a healthy one with an unhealthy one, that the energy consumption of the one that's going to break down three weeks from now kind of spiked up slowly but surely, trying to compensate the fact that there was a problem with the bearings which was caused by a grease line that wasn't functioning properly. And so all of a sudden it's all too late and the thing break, <coughs> breaks down, right? Purely looking at the data. And then you can start doing all sorts of things, in, in, again, in terms of maintenance advice and so on. So a fascinating world. And again, uh, this particular client also on the, on the car dumpers would tell us, give the operators and the people in the control rooms one number or a traffic light or whatever it needs to be, something that's easy to interpret. We don't care how complex the algorithms are underneath. Keep it simple in terms of understanding what's going on. Productivity, um, spatial temporal analytics. Um, so here you have uh, a miner, uh, an open pit mine in, uh, in Brazil. And they would tell us, look, again, massive n amount of data. Um, we've got whatever it was, MindStar or Modular or whatever it was. We've got dispatch systems. We've got all kinds of systems. Uh, talking to us, giving bleeps and, and, and alarms and pings and everything else, uh, we can't really make a lot of sense out of it. So can you come and have a look and see uh, if we can do something? You know, I'll give you the next slide, which kind of explains what, what it is we did. One of the first things that was, was designed, and this, so this is the movement of trucks in an open pit environment, uh, and particularly you know, the load to haul, uh, the load haul cycle, right? So you have the various phases within the, the load haul cycle from empty to queuing on spot, <coughs> you load them full and then dumping. 
And then here, how long does it take in each, each different step of the process? Uh, you've got the truck, the excavator, and so on. So here you have this, what we call the cycle flow. And then you can start looking at a shift, at all shifts in a day. You can start uh, looking at what is, you know, color coding this thing. What is it the dispatchers or the production people would expect as an ideal cycle flow? What should it look like? And if it deviates, can we start color coding it? And this is something we absolutely don't expect. It's taken way too long in the queuing side and so on. You can start correlating it to um, uh, weather conditions, to blast events, to uh, terrain conditions, uh, and then start looking at things. And interestingly, one of the things we found was, because of it's almost the first time you would have around the table dispatch people, production people, maintenance people, you know, safety people talking to each other, looking at this thing, and they would look at an overview, say, for a, for a given shift, for a given part of the mine, and they would say, oh, wow, what's this? Lines crossing each other. It really means that one truck overtakes the other. That's a safety risk. Can't be. Never happens. Can you please check the data again? We check them, it happens. Now, who does this thing? Okay, let's look at the, uh, at the operator records, and let's see if we can find a correlation between the age profile of the operator and the number of incidents happening. And lo and behold, of course, the young guys were the guys overtaking in the queue. The older guys were nicely following all the procedures and you know, staying put. Um, for instance, just as an example. Um, and then, of course, ultimately, you know, this is the ideal movement of the trucks. Um, Productivity loss happens when there's deviation. We need to understand when and why the deviation happens and then build uh, a process and, and, and potentially information around it to, to uh, prevent it from happening. So big deal. And again, like I said, it's a bit of a virtual control on top of an open pit environment. Um, so you get, uh, more co get to grips with it more. Uh, predictive energy optimization, just as an example, and, and I'll, I'll, I'll briefly touch on this, but of course it's a big deal. Um, uh, where we've learned to trade is in steel making. In steel making, uh, um, and this is uh, with POSCO, and, and this is Wisco, Wuhan Iron Steel Company. The thing about steel making is, of course, you produce a lot of energy as well. You've got, um, you've got both energy production, energy consumption. Obviously, it's highly energy intensive, um, and so you've got lots of variables to play with. I would tell you that uh, what you almost always find um, in this kind of environment, you look at energy and people say, okay, give me your energy data, please. There is no synchronization, no alignment between the production scheduling and the energy consumption, the price it costs. So there's no real prediction on energy consumption. People look at it as an unconstrained resource you can source from. And it may be the case, it's always the grid, uh, but it comes at a cost. Uh, so from the moment you start really aligning or taking the conscious decision of aligning your production schedule to your energy cost impact, you start having lots of, of benefits. You would find, we've just done a project with a Brazilian steel maker, and um, interestingly, if you, if, again, you always start with historic data. So you say, okay, give me whatever, six months, 12 months, 18 months of, of data. Of course, you have the benefit of hindsight. You've got perfect production schedule prediction because you know what the production was. And then you start looking at the way the energy flows. Um, the cost impact there we found was 30%. I asked the guys three or four times, guys, impossible, impossible, go back. We tuned it down to 10% because there's uncertainty in the correcting for the uncertainty in the production schedule and, and production variation, but still a massive number. Um, and in this case, it was, uh, Coke's gas was simply vented off in s instead of uh, re recuperated properly into the process as an energy source. You need to both look at your energy balance and where you source the energy from, as well as when you consume it, and align it with the, uh, with the production forecast as I just described. Very easy to do. As many of these projects, and I, uh, uh, you know, I can not stress it enough, these are particularly the initial analysis is, is, is in terms of intrusiveness is zero, right? You, you give us your uh, historic data, please. And we'll have a look, um, and we'll see what comes out. Then to build it into the operational process, of course, is you know the intellectual work already by that time would have been done. Then, then it becomes, like I said, strangely enough, again, no-brainer kind of discussion becomes a change management issue. But um, more often than not, makes a lot of sense. Very low intrusion, zero capex. Like I said, it's an opex kind of environment uh, with uh, with a big uh, big business case. 
This is an uh, aluminium smelter and um, you have a pot line of like 200 pots and, um, and uh, the client told us, you know, if you can save us 0.5% on the energy cost, we'll be friends forever, right? Um, <coughs> that was the deal. It was a research project, so data scientists looking at this. Now, the business of aluminium smelting is complex um, because it's not just the energy consumption optimization around that. It's the, it's the, uh, the quality of the aluminium needs to be consistent. And very importantly, you cannot kill the pot. You can do wild things, right? You can start playing around with operational parameters and lo and behold, you know, one month later, your pot needs to be repaired. Not a good thing. Um, so, complex. Also, some interventions are really short-term, like second to second, minute to minute. Uh, you see immediate response to the way the process behaves. Sometimes you can uh, do an insertion of something, you can add uh, some, some additives, whatever it is, and you only see the, the effect days later. So you've got these time series complexities, you've got these complexities around the fact that you need to balance pot life with quality, with energy consumption, and then you need to get through. As a matter of fact, in full collaboration with, uh, with the um, uh, aluminium producer, the result is there. So that project is now expanding to all the pot lines for that, uh, for that producer. Something like 0. Point whatever, 4 or 5% of energy saving is on the horizon and that's being continued. Again, first looking at historic data. Mine on demand. Um, I'm talking about uh, individual solutions here. Uh, again, the idea being, you know, the smart solution, they work from data, they, they, they work from an ingestion of data from the shop floor. It really becomes interesting when you start having them talk to each other. Like I said earlier, I cannot stress it enough. I think it's important to, like I said, uh, to have a vision saying, you know what, there's quite a few domains to be looked at. We've got quite some good data already sitting around the organization. Let's build a priority and a roadmap and let's start working on this thing. And first and foremost, let's start building a platform that allows us to ingest all of this and then pick one which is high priority, then the next one, then the next one. Mine on Demand is, uh, is about the following. This is a project we've done with a platinum miner in South Africa. This is an underground mine. Um, they came to us and said, look, the business of mine design, some, some people call it mine planning, let's call it just mine design. It's a very static affair. You do it once a year, it takes six weeks. And off you go. And then a year later, you do the same. And off you go. And there are certain fixed assumptions, like cutoff grades and whatever it may be, which are not necessarily um, flexible and aligned to market reality. Prices change. This is a platinum producer. So they have palladium as well, in this case. Uh, and they need to make choices, depending on where demand and the price is, how to design the mine. And then it becomes more complex because once you have the mine design, you then try to optimally sequence all the tasks that relate to that mine design. And for instance, one shaft of this platinum mine had, over the lifespan of the, of the mine, 10,000 tasks. And you need to optimally sequence them and then carry on as you go. And then one year later, you do it again. <coughs> so the scheduling people say, okay, give me the mine design and all its constraints, and I'll work it. What you should have is um, mine design that doesn't take six weeks, but maybe 15 minutes. Um, and then once it comes through, maybe an hour. <laughs> And, and when it comes through, you need to be able to dynamically schedule the tasks in an optimal way and carry on as prices and volumes change. Um, and you don't do it once a year, you do it every couple of months, whatever makes sense to you. But for you to be able to respond to um, changing markets, which is the reality of course we live in, much faster. The mind design piece um, takes a template-based mine design solution. MineRP's got one, it's a technical, uh, it's like a mining technical system provider where they uh, have found a way of doing this. Taking them years to, to build up that knowledge and actually incorporate it into, uh, into the solution they have for mine design. Um, and then we step in and say, okay, we'll optimize the, the sequencing of the task. Complex, highly constrained. I, I would say that in terms of uh, 
complexity, underground mining is more constrained than if when you would be working in open cast or an open pit. We had a discussion with Rio Tinto. Th these were the iron ore people for Rio, T Rio Tinto just this week in New York, and they would tell us, well, yeah, okay, we got the picture, but maybe for an open pit mine with all its heavy equipment uh, and, and uh, capex in, in, in intensive environment around the pit, it's not that easy to say, okay, let's stop mining here, let's go there. Could well be. Here it worked. And uh, the calculations that came out was, you know, an added NPV of, you know, plus two or three percent. Massive, massive uh, good money. This is a good client of ours, and, and so we're, uh, this is ongoing. Um, interestingly, also, I would, I would say is that in this case, your <coughs> ore body becomes, through, through the technologies involved, your ore body becomes a, an inventory to source, to fulfill demand from into your SAP system, so if you have SAP, whatever, your ERP system. So you don't have this eternal breakpoint between a typical supply part, as in the push model from, from the mine, and then whatever demand is asking you, um, you have an integration point. Your ore body becomes inventory to fulfill demand from. So instead of, here's the mine design with its constraints now sequence, no, no, here's demand, design the mine around it, and I optimize the sequencing of the tasks going forward. And this is my final slide. Um, and it's kind of, it's a technology that exists today, co cognitive computing, and it's got to do with unstructured data. And, and um, there's a technology called Watson. Um, and what Watson does, it can read and understand uh, text, and it can uh, give you, can feed back to you uh, make sense out of the text. It all started publicly with, uh, I'm not sure if you're aware of that, maybe many of you are, with the Jeopardy quiz, the American US quiz, where, where Watson stepped in and, and w won the quiz as we beat Kaspar of some years before in the chess game. It's kind of a publicity thing, but it kind of tells a story at the same time, because here you have these computers with no access to the internet, by the way, on itself, uh, just dumping everything you can find on in the damn thing. It was a machine that kind of fits in half of this room, I think, uh, and trying to answer all these complex questions around the vast uh, um, area of domains and then winning. And the point that was being made was, here we have a technology that can really understand text and make sense of it, answer questions, but importantly, can also ask questions, saying, I'm, I'm not sure if this is, I understand what you mean, can you explain further? And then it learns, and then, then it learns. The first case, just to bring it, li uh, bring it to life, the, f the first case we, we really uh, started using it was in oncology. There's no, if you look at what, what a surgeon can read and absorb in terms of articles in the area of medicine, it can be m on a yearly basis maybe 100, 200, right? If you have a technology that can read through millions over anything published the past two to three years, that is of vast value, right? That's an amazing uh, addition to the surgeon's insights. Not only that, but then say, okay, according to me, the diagnosis is X with 80%, Y with 60, Z with 15%. This is why I'm thinking that th these are the answers. And by the way, I would really like to ask these questions. Uh, can you give me the answers to those questions as well so I, I bump up uh, the reliability of, uh, of, of the information I'm providing you? Now, then you can start thinking, okay, now let's think about mining, and, and is there maybe something we can do for mining with cognitive computing? Again, we had a workshop this week on it, and one of the things that came through is the following, just to give you an idea, and they're really fun workshops, right? So this is really, it only takes 20 minutes to, to come up with something and then start debating it and getting into this thing. Wouldn't it be great um, if we would have a solution that understands communication that's going on in the commodity market, particularly around China, really understands what is it people are saying and thinking, thinking, putting in blogs, articles, uh, media, and so on, about how they feel about the co commodity markets at a point in time and start predicting commodity prices and, and demand before it actually happens. Wouldn't it be great if you really would understand, for instance, what's happening with construction in China and how people feel and, and talk about this? So we can feed it into some kind of predictive model, say, so, okay, I'm talking iron ore again, um, this is the way, with an 80% probability, <coughs> the, the construction market in, uh, in China is going. 
And then weeks on before and say, okay, I don't know, price probably is not going to go up uh, anytime soon. And you can really start building it into your planning, your sales and operations planning and how you run your plants and so on, just as an example. It's a big deal. To, for us, I mean, 90%, I believe that's the number, 90% of all the information ever created was done in the, in the past two, three years. 70, 80% of it is unstructured, text, photo, all that kind of stuff. You need to be able to come to grips with it, and this is a technology that can do it. That's it. I don't know how we work with questions or anything.